you know, they get to Flinders Street Station and they're changing <laughs> platforms with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings from the Voodoo Lounge. Today's guest is Darren Frugia. We're rolling, motherfuckers, and we're here with Darren Frugia in the Voodoo Lounge. Hello, Darren. Hello, Peter. It's nice to be here. Absolutely, brother. And uh, how's your week transpired so, thus far? Uh, it's been, you know, my week sort of consists of uh, coming into this room. This is my studio where I practice and I give online lessons, which I have to do at this stage. I record. I'm doing some recordings for some people. And so I spend time in here. The rest of the time I'm... Um, chasing criminals. Ch- chasing criminals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that, was, that was kind of, that was really exciting, actually. Um, you know, it's not something I get to do often. <laughs> so were you in the backyard or something and you noticed a couple of guys? The, 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 way, the way it transpired was that I, I, was in, I was in here. I got up early and I was in here um, doing some stuff and my girlfriend came in and said, our, our electricity is out. So what I did was, um, I, you know, the sort of normal thing to do is ask if the neighbours have got have lost their electricity and so their their electricity wasn't affected so I went to the fuse box to see if one of the switches had tripped that was all fine and then um, Lana had said that she saw two guys in hoodies sort of walking down the street and then we noticed that in the car park next to our building that's attached to our building that their um, that the the power box the door had been ripped off and all the power had been turned off so I thought well I'm going to be Mr Superhero and get on my bike and see if I can get a couple of photos of these guys so I went for a ride down to the creek went in another direction rang up my girlfriend and said what do they look like and she said they're actually at a house on the corner they've gone into this house where this old lady lives so I rode back as fast as I could by the time I got back there they had jumped out of the house so I got back on my bike to have a look for these dudes and I saw them on the creek uh, just emptying bags of jewelry and you know throwing papers away while all these you know passers-by were looking at them going hey you know what's going on this is a bit weird so I I rode up a little further and snapped a couple of photos of them first and then I called up my girlfriend and said okay this is where they're located and then she's sort of ringing up the police and and um locating to them or, or or alerting them to where they were and so we were just relaying messages until the cops came and arrested them and uh, you know, the, all the neighbours were out taking care of this. So it was this real community, uh, real community effort. It's it was it was really nice. Neighbourhood watch, mate. Yeah, it, that's what it's like, and it should be because uh, those type of stories. We're, I mean, we're in a pretty bad state at the moment. I think it only you know only heightens the fact that uh, Coronaville has kicked in, and uh, you know, young kids when you're 21 years of age, you, you or or if you're in your early 20s, whatever it is. Uh, you seem to be a bit immune to uh, what's going on, and you know, if you if you if I was 21 years old now, man, and I would sniff Corona, you know, and I think that I was invincible. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. That's how crazy you are when you're that age. And I, and it takes me back to a situation where um, in the early 90s, when we went through the recession uh, that we had to have. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I do. Uh, but we were in a pretty bad state and I recall my uh, mother going uh, shopping one afternoon as she did with her trolley and um, someone hit her from behind and stole her purse and she had blood coming out of her head. And, oh, uh, yeah. and anyway, so she came back home and I, was, I came back for lunch because I used to work around the area and uh, she came out all distorted. And, and I remember the guy, my next door neighbour, who was a third down black belt, he saw her first. So he put her in the ute to try and find the person who, who if she can recall the person who hit her. And she had no recollection because, you know, she couldn't speak English. You know what it's like. And uh, yeah, she couldn't communicate that well. But I've got to tell you, then I got into the ute, we got her out, and we went looking for who we, Look, we, I was so irate because I was only in my early 20s myself. And I've got to tell you, man, if we had caught that guy... We would have made mincemeat out of him, you know. <laughs> he, I mean, he, was, he got off easy. <laughs> he got off easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then that's what I mean. You're like you, you, the repercussions of your actions um, when you're that age. You don't think 
because if you you know you could hit somebody and damage them severely, and uh, they could end up in hospital for with some really severe um, ramification. Oh, oh yeah, per- permanent per- brain per- damage, permanent and- damage, or whatever it is, you know. So um, just going on about uh, Coronaville, we are in uncertain times. What what's your uh, take on it, man? How how are you coping with it generally? Um, look, I, I've. Yeah, I'm not going to get miserable about it. And so I'm just using, you know, I mean, how often do I get to have all this time to myself? Mm. You know what? I mean, it's such an extreme level of circumstance that has put us into this position where we have all been leveled, all been equalized, yes. every, everyone on the planet. And so therefore we, uh, we're all in the same boat. So I have all of this time. So I'm remaining positive i'm thinking well i can do stuff i can get stuff done and i'm you know practice i record videos at home for youtube you build stuff I'm, I'm, I, I i haven't built i haven't built anything um, you haven't i built really anything. want to but no and no, i've just so, i've been so busy doing other things and uh, you know what i what i need to do and again this is another thing that i need to do now that i have all this time is i need to uh how do i put it um clear out my garage i have no space left in there you know every time i drive my car in there's stuff on either side you know it's just that thing of just getting organized and good clearing time out stuff. good time for a garage sale mate uh, yeah or or yeah or just give stuff away i mean i like giving stuff to charity you know there are people out there that can use this stuff more than me sure so um so yeah I, i'm just i'm i'm it's not bothering me. I, yeah. I mean, I miss I miss doing gigs, but in other ways, I'm enjoying staying at home and just yeah. I, I'm I'm enjoying the creative side of it, and I, I'm enjoying how creative other people are. You know, yeah. just I see all this stuff on Facebook where musicians have got together and they've recorded stuff in their own individual studios, and then they've created created this collaboration, and you know, the creativity. We live in a we live in a time of incredible creativity. Absolutely, actually. absolutely, and. Um so there's this article that I was reading about a Christian group in Louisiana and they were handing out blessed handkerchiefs, man, to 1,200 people to their parish congregation. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, with corona, I mean, all those handkerchiefs being blessed by the, the priest and giving it to the parish uh, congregation, I mean, don't you think that's a bit scary? You know, I've, I've I've been reading other things too, like um, you know some some religious leaders. You know, and I'm talking about extreme, I guess extreme sort of Christianity or whatever it is you want to call it. Uh, you know, saying things like you know that this whole thing has been brought about to, um, you know, because God is angry with gay yeah. people yeah, and, right. and all of that stuff. I, I just I I can't. There's side there's a side of me that infuriates me, and then there's there's a side of it that that. Um, that sort of makes me laugh that I think it's actually quite comical that, you know, in this day and age that people still, that's, that, that's where their head has to take them. But 1200 people, I mean, that's a lot of people. Well, that is a lot of people. And it's a lot of hankies. Hanky, yeah. And, 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 and in addition to that, what, what are they, what do they mean? Like you, so if you take the hanky and you blow your nose with it, that you'll be cured or you're just going to have holy snot. I'm not really sure <laughs> what the purpose, <laughs> I haven't thought of it that far ahead, but uh, I, I just, when I read that article, I just sort of looked and I thought, what does that look like? What does that actually, how, you know, it's like the bread, you know, like if you were a Catholic, you used to get the bread and put it in your mouth and uh, but now you're getting a hanky instead of the bread. You know what I yeah, mean? Just I'd, everyone queuing up at the altar getting a hanky that's been blessed. <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's like uh, it's like it's like queuing up for merchandise at yeah, the church. <laughs> so um, let's move away from uh, Coronaville for a moment. And I, what I really want to tap into is um, because your Maltese background, yeah. And and what year did your parents come uh, migrate to Australia? Um, I think they both migrated in the same year. Um, obviously, they didn't migrate together because they were kids. Um, I think it was nineteen fifty-five, if I recall correctly. Okay, so. The, my parents came out in 1949. Wow, that's so, early. Yeah, so well, it was around the same time. But they were. My father had fought in the Second World War and then came out and worked and set up the uh, houses in Carlton and then brought my mother and four kids from Malta and then they sort of started their life in Australia. But um, with you, with you, did you have a musical f- 
upbringing? Did your p- father play drums, or did yeah? So, so my dad played the drums. My dad came from a musical family, so my dad played the drums. My dad's one of ten kids, um, so his dad played guitar, and he one of his brothers played accordion, and another brother played the saxophone, and um, they had uh, a band. They would play it. I think my dad played in a wedding band with his dad and one of his brothers. And then at, that was before I was born. I think that was actually before my dad was married. And then my earliest recollections were of a band that my father had with his brother who played sax. And, you know, they would either rehearse at our house and I'd watch these rehearsals when I was a kid. So th- so, so, they, yeah, so, he, they, so they were doing... Uh like dinner dances, that sort of thing? Yeah, or, yeah, 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 sort of all that stuff within the Maltese community, yeah. um, and most of which was sort of centred around the western suburbs, you know, St yeah. Albans, Sunshine, Deer S- Park. St Albans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, that's right. And uh, because, uh, as you know, my family has a number of musicians uh, in the family. Uh, however, my father played... Um, trumpet in the uh, band you know in Malta they have those um, ba- the, 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 festers. The, the festers yeah, yeah. And, and you know how yeah. the guys walk down the street and play yeah. well my father used to play that trumpet oh right beautiful um, so yeah I'm not really sure why my uh, siblings got involved with music because my brother one of my brothers played piano accordion and Joe played obviously sax and sang and my sister used to sing with him and stuff that was way before I was I came along um, but I just know that it sort of galvalizes the family, you know, with music. Uh, it, it's such a um, – when when everyone plays at home or there's a common theme uh, relating uh, music, uh, it seems to um, – no matter what's going on, like now, like we've got no other option but to listen to music if, if that's – you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's a really great thing, you know. And, and that's what it brings to uh, people's lives, you know, some happiness, some uh, fond yeah. memories, or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, that's a that's that's always an interesting point, you know. I mean, especially the combination of family and music, you know, when that there's a beautiful thing when a family gets together at any time, whether it's Easter, Christmas, birthdays, or whatever. When a family's together, it's a, it's it's a beautiful thing. I never take that for granted, and certainly as I get older, I I make sure I never take that for granted but but when there's music involved in it when there's members of the family that get to perform together or any of those types of things uh, I think that's you know it just makes it the bond even more special and you know probably about 30 years ago I saw some footage for the first time that was taken um, not far from where I live my parents where my dad migrated to Malta with his family they lived in Stall Street um, in Coburg here and um, there was footage of them that someone had filmed. There was no sound, unfortunately, but it was footage of my dad and my grandfather and a couple of his br- brothers uh, playing in the backyard at some party or a wedding or a family wedding or something like that. Again, this was before my parents were married, so I, I'm not even sure if my mum was dating my dad at this stage. But, you know, seeing that, man, it really warmed my heart. Oh, I just thought it was such a beautiful thing. Backyard concerts were the thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. They, they, they were. They, I mean, my, my brothers used to play in the backyard, uh, have big parties in the backyard. I mean, I remember my brother playing in the mid-'70s there with, for my brother – because I we got two sets of twins and they just had turned I think twenty one or something like that and I was only like a five year old kid. My dad said you are not to go outside, you know, and I could just look through the window, and I, the whole backyard was just chockers, you know, and uh, they were even in my father's vegetable patch, where it, which he didn't, he wasn't happy about that. <laughs> he wouldn't have been happy. About <laughs> he, that he wasn't at happy all. about that. <laughs> and uh, and then the music started, and I mean, but the thing is. It was a community thing. I mean, the neighbours were there, the people across the road were there. I mean, it was just people were spilling out into the front yard, out into the street. It was just unbelievable, you know, and, and it went on the next day. And at six six o'clock, because, you know, when you're a kid, you just get up early and you run around and stuff. And I look out and they're still cooking barbecues out the back, you know. At That's sort of, amazing. You know, so that was sort of my recollection but getting back to you with um you, uh, what i wanted to know is um who were your influences when you were sort of growing up uh and listening to music 
Well, you know, my first influence obviously was my dad because he was the only musician I knew apart from the people that would, well, he was certainly the only drummer I knew apart. And, and then the musicians that would come around at our place that were rehearsing with him were, um, you know, the, the only musicians that I had exposure to. I mean, I'm talking about a very young age, maybe three, four, five years old. But as I got a little older, you know, and I became aware of, you know, music in terms of not just what you heard on the radio, but things that your parents had in their record collection or music that friends would play you or um, my older relatives, my cousins would play me. You know, I started to, I think my, my earliest recollections, um, let me see. I remember as a little kid watching the Beatles cartoon. There used to be a Beatles cartoon, yeah, and was, that was the first time. I, Yellow that Summer was the first time I, No, there was actually a, a, like a short sort of half hour or 20 minute cartoon that was on every day yeah, on right. the TV. Okay. And that was my first exposure to the Beatles as a little kid. And I remember immediately liking it. I really yeah. liked it. And, and, and then. And then so I was into that and then there was another cartoon about the Osmonds and there was also a Jackson 5 cartoon. So I was into all of that as a kid. And then my dad um, had some Creedence Clearwater records and then as I got a bit older I'd play along to those records and um, I played along to Hot August Night and there was a Tom Jones record I used to play along to. So that was just me playing along to music. My dad also, you know... um, I don't know what possessed him to do this, but at a very young age, when I was I was a kid, he bought me um, some Sandy Nelson records. And Sandy Nelson was a... He's still alive. Sandy Nelson was a session drummer who played on a lot of sessions in, I think, California. Um, and so Sandy was one of these guys that released records that featured the drums. And there was a lot of it was kind of surfy music and things like that. It wasn't necessarily jazz so much, but it was kind of rock and roll. He was a rock and roll drummer, one of the pioneers. And, um, you know, that just, again, that exposed me to drums. And, and I would try and copy stuff with my limited knowledge and limited technical capability. I would try and copy the stuff and just play along to it. And then my parents saw this uh, enthusiasm, you know, and bought me drums and they just kept nurturing this, this, desire and passion that I had for music. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, it was great. Well, that's terrific. But you, um, was ABBA, apparently ABBA was one of your influences, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, how old, maybe when I was eight or nine, I, uh, you know, got into ABBA. Man, I've got to... they were really... i got to tell They were really popular. Well, they were. Um, but I've got to say, I saw a... Because uh, Agatha, is that her name? The blonde girl? Uh, uh, I think it's Anietta or something like that. There was a picture of her. She just turned 70 years years of age. Really? She looks incredible for 70 years of age. Wow. And anyway, there was an insert of her when she was on this picture that she's looking, you know, beautiful at 70. And then there was her above as an insert picture of her when she was playing with ABBA in the mid-70s. And those leotards, man, how the fuck did she fit into those? Because they were so tight. I reckon they used to get a crane and just put pick her up and just put her in these leotards and then just strap her in and they used to just cling to her skin, you know what I mean? Like they were just so tight. Yeah, you know, it's funny. As a little kid, I probably wouldn't have recognised that because I was just so into the songs and the vibe. But that, now that I think about it, as a, as an adult, they must have smeared some kind of lubricant on their legs so they could slide into these pants. No, man, I just thought, you know, because they were, I mean, I'm looking at the picture and I'm going, man, those leotards are really tight. I mean, you know, they were really... But- they, they probably don't leave much to the imagination. No, they either. don't. They don't. And it's hard to, when you look at her when she's 70, it, it's hard to believe that she was, you know, that way inclined it, uh, getting uh, fit, fitted out with those uh, type of outfits back in those days, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, that was the first concert I ever went to. I mean, apart from seeing local bands and stuff like that when I was a little kid that my dad would was take Was that at the My Music Bowl? That was at the Maya Music Bowl, and it was—I remember—it was during Moomba. It was that period, so it was—it was—it was, it was the thirtieth of March, nineteen seventy-seven. Wow! I remember and it was my—it was, it was my birthday present. So my birthday is in—is this month, and that was my tenth birthday present. My parents bought me a ticket to see ABBA. Fantastic! Blew my mind. I was—it was amazing. 
Yeah, my first concert uh, was actually um, my brother. Oh, cool. <laughs> he came to my secondary cool. school when I was uh, in year seven with the Falcons. Oh, great. And uh, it was, m- and I put it together with the English teacher, uh, and we sold uh, raffle tickets and we sold lamingtons and all sorts of stuff to try and come up with the 900 bucks that Frank Stavala wanted uh, for the gig. <laughs> 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 and, uh, <laughs> anyways. I think he charges a little more. Than <laughs> I that know now. he does. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, they were doing me a, di- a, a good deal. But, you know, the thing is, we, there I was, you know, first thing in the morning, because I went to a tech school, you went to a tech school, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you know what it was like, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was eating those uh, buns, and I used to put the twisties inside the bun and eat the twisty. Yeah. Did you ever do that? And yeah. I, I was there with a can of coke and that twisty uh, roll, and these three big semi trailers came down the side of the hall, and then they just started rolling out all the PA gear, and these guys were you know, they were setting up everything, the PA, the lights. Everything, the back line, everything was in these semi-trailers and, they were, and that stuff was really heavy back in those days, you know. And I just sort of thought, while I was eating that twisty sandwich, I thought I could never do that job, being, <laughs> being a <Wow>. roadie. <laughs> 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 right. And there I am, you know, thank God that uh, these days a lot of the, the PA is a lot lighter so you don't have to uh, do the semi-trailer stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I I remember seeing. I remember when I first started doing gigs with PAs and just seeing how massive those boxes were, those bins, those W bins, yeah. and all of that sort of oh, stuff. It was huge. crazy. It was huge. But the thing, and they used to pack it down and reset and drive to another town the same night. You know, like yeah. they used to work really hard. You know, um, yeah. But uh, and also, you're a you're a keen uh, Footscray supporter. Is that correct? I am. I am. I, I can't believe there's no football on at the moment. It's driving me crazy. Really? I've waited, like I, I waited all of summer because I'm also a big, I'm a massive cricket fan too. Okay. So, so you know, I, I hang out for the tests over the summer. I have a little ritual where, you know, the first session of every test, I'll have a bacon and eggs breakfast and sit in front of the TV and watch the cricket. And the cricket was massively disappointing. The summer was just a bad summer of cricket. Uh, you know, it, the, the, there wasn't much comp. New Zealand didn't play that great, and um, I think there was Pakistan. They didn't play so great, you know. And Australia just won these so easily. There was no competition. There was no- so I, I got sick of that and just started watching reruns of football games from last year, um, and you know, and and always watching you know the highlights of the 2016 Grand Final. Of course you did. And so I was, uh, and and so yeah, I got really excited about the the season starting. And so, you know, we had round one to no crowd, so it was really weird to watch. Um, the Bulldogs got thrashed by Collingwood in round one, and then that's the end of the season. So I'm really interested to see, you know, how, where what, this is going to go. Yeah, I'm not sure myself, but um, I have, because I used to live near the Western Oval um, as a kid, um, I remember one particular time that uh, my first ever game that I went to the Western Oval was in the mid 80s and I was only a teen you know I was 14 or something and I met this beautiful girl at uh, Flagstaff Gardens and uh, she was the head of the uh, South Melbourne cheer squad so she invited me she goes oh well I'll meet you on Saturday and you come to the South Melbourne Footscray game okay so I went and uh, she said I'll you know come and hold (laughs) come and hold the banner up for us you know so I'm there on the ground, I've never been to the Western Oval, right? So I'm like, I've been promoted. You know, I've gone there, met the girl. She said, hold the banner up. We're holding the banner up. They run through it. Mate, I didn't watch the game. I was watching her because she was so beautiful that I just kept watching her. And I'm, and then the rain started to come and then that was it, mate. She went that way. I went that way. And uh, I remember walking home in the rain uh bitterly disappointed and uh, drenched but that's not the only time I got drenched I I got drenched when my uh, I went to the 1981 grand final Carlton Collingwood um, and the only way I the way I got there was um, this guy who lived across the road from me uh, was in the Carlton cheer squad and he and on the Friday night before the game he said 
we're going to build a banner. Can we use your front yard to build the banner? I said, sure. He said, we'll give you some free tickets to see the grand final. I said, all right. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So they built this banner. We were there till about midnight. And then this truck or van came the next morning, picked it up. And they said, here's your, you know, the thing is, we'll meet you at the uh, gate, whatever it was. And then he came and goes, man, we don't have a ticket for you. He said, the thing is, go to the Salvation Army, the woman there, and just tell her that you've lost your ticket and she'll give you a ticket. So I said, all right, went up to this Salvation Army person and uh, said, look, uh, I've lost my ticket. And she goes, oh, you poor darling. I said, yeah, I know. I'm just, and I started to cry, you know. And that, like fake, fake, so fake cry. tears. I started brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> and she goes, where would you like to stand or sit? And I said, behind the goals where the Carlton Cheer Squad is. She goes, no worries. And she gave me this ticket. And she get, and it was on the forward pocket down the front. It was fantastic. Carlton won. Oh, man. But the thing was, I got I caught the train home. And the, again, it started to fucking rain. So I'm, in, I'm at Newport train station. I've got 20 cents left. I ring my, my parents. My mother answers the phone. said, Ma, it's Pete. Peter not here. I said, no, 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 it's me. It's your son. No, 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 Peter not here. Call back later. And she hung up on me. And I had no more money. And I'm going, I can't believe I've got to walk. So I missed the bus, the last bus. So I had to walk from Newport. And I had hole, I had those four-star runners. that used to, And I had holes in them. So... And thin socks, so I wasn't dressed appropriately. So by the time I got home, man, my feet, you know, that squeaky sound when you yeah. when your feet, I had that, the socks were slipping inside the inside of the uh, slipper. And uh, when I got home, man, I was, you know, I, me and my mother had words. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's a sad story on many levels, you know, and, and getting back to the first story. It's a shame you didn't get to keep the, the South Melbourne banner. At least you could have used that as protection from the rain. But the, the, but the second story, like, what sort of mother doesn't recognise her own son's I know, voice? I know, right? That that sounds like something from a Cheech and Chong. I clip, know. You know, like a, I know. You know, no, he, my Peter's not here. No, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm Peter. It's yeah. your son. No, he's yeah. not here. And exactly. That, that's very sad. I know, right? I couldn't believe it. I was, I'm, I'm smashing the, I was, I grabbed the phone handle. I was so frustrated. I was smashing it on the phone. I'm going, it's me, man. It's me. <laughs> it's a funny, you know, it's a funny thing that, you know, like everything is so incredibly tightly regulated today. Like you can't go to a, no, you can't that's go right. to a, you, you can't cry to someone to give you a ticket and they just give you a ticket. That's and right. The next thing. But and, and funny thing about, you know, this, I heard this funny story about this, this Maltese people and train stations. And that is that there was this, someone in, a Maltese guy or a Maltese family in St. Albans bought a horse <laughs> from from somewhere in the eastern <laughs> suburbs <laughs> and they got the horse back home by train. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, so you know they're walking around. You know they get to Flinders Street Station and they're changing platforms with a horse. <laughs> Do you believe That's that? That's amazing. Do you believe that? That is outrageous. What sort of yeah, horse was it? A, a ten, I, ten hands or fourteen it, hands? I don't know. I, I don't know how tall it was, but it was a horse. You know, like Mister Red. It's not even. It was huge. I mean, that's like, but they they got away with it back in those days. It yeah. seemed like that was something you could do. I mean, tr- imagine imagine trying to do that now. I know, man. You would get oh man, you'd be getting fines left, right, and centre. The horse would get a fine. The horse would get a fine. <laughs> you know, how am I going to pay that? Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but getting back to that, was it seventy nine Collingwood Carlton Grand Final? Yeah, yeah. Seven, yeah, I remember having a gig that day. Oh wow. Yeah. What a a gig I, at the ground or. Not not a not a gig at the ground. I had um, one of my first gigs, which was a a Maltese Putstitzi night. Okay. And and I I was in a band. I got paid twenty five bucks. Yeah. And that was my first. I think that was my first gig. Okay. And I, I, I and what was special to me about that, you know, like again, recollection wise was that my grandparents were there and my aunties, some of my aunties and uncles were there and my dad and mum were there. And that was that, that's, again, a real special thing of being able to share that experience um, uh, with, with them. A Pat Sisti night. And that was uh, in a hall or was it? A... That was in a hall in Reservoir. Okay. 
the good not old... Not far from here. And it, it was the 29th of September, 1979, if I recall correctly. And, and uh, there weren't people rocking up in, with horse... On horseback, were they? No, no, there was no, no there was no horse. There was, I, when I didn't look outside, they may have been parked outside, you know. <laughs> but, but the, you know, talking about the, um, you, you may or may not know this, but you know, for for quite a number of years, I used to play drums on the music that was played for the pre pre match entertainment. Oh, right. So, so mostly in the nineteen nineties, I did a whole bunch of those, and so for the grand uh, final. And this is, yeah, for the grand yeah. final. Yeah. So um, we would go into the studio a month before and record backing tracks for, you know, Farnham, Slim Dusty or yeah. whoever was going to be performing on that event. And then um, we would go to the ground on grand final day and mime. So there's um, a little bit of footage, um, you know, from those those pre-match entertainment uh, events uh, you know, me miming, and it was that was so funny, man. Like they would not let us stay at the ground. They would not, you know, like uh, once you're once you're done, you're, done. you're out. You're out. You, we, don't, we don't have tickets for you. Got just get that, get get out. So there, there was that was annoying, and and they were they were real. Um, I don't know who was responsible. I think it wasn't. I don't know if it was the AFL, so to speak, but it was probably the people who who were responsible for organising the, the entertainment. Event, yeah. they, were, they, were, they were they were real Nazis, like. I got in trouble because I wore sunglasses. It was like sunny and warm this particular day and really bright. And I had sunglasses on. I think a couple of the other musicians had sunglasses on. I mean, we, got, we got in trouble. We got in trouble for wearing sunglasses. Yeah, have you ever done a fashion show before? Um, I did one, yeah, I did one sometime in the early 90s. Okay, I used to do them at, uh, and I was doing one at Jeff Shed once and we spent 24 hours setting up the PA and stuff because we had to bring everything in. And there was this uh, guy walking around with a clipboard to his chest. And throughout the day before, I'm like, I'm going, who's this guy with the clipboard? You know, you got to, you always got to be wary of people who've got clipboards tightly to their chest, you know. Yeah. So we're like 10 minutes from the show time and we've done all the rehearsals, we've done everything, and he goes up, he comes up to me and goes, excuse me, What's that? I'm going, what do you mean, what's that? He goes, that. I said, that's the PA. Can't have it there, sorry. You have to move it. I'm going, what, I'm going, what mate? I go, it's 10 minutes before the show. You want me to de-rig a PA and put it somewhere else? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, yes, you must do it now. And I'm like, uh, no, that's not going to happen. So I had to go. we had to go through this whole hierarchy of people for them to tell him, that can't happen and it was just really stressful 10 minutes before the show um having been there all day the day before setting it up he was there he's quite aware where it was all going and and then he says to me and the thing was he had no paper on that clipboard that that was the other thing that got me he just he just held that clipboard and he walked around you know it was was, like a security blanket it it was (laughs) it was a crazy thing but um i was gonna say what was his reason for that for wanting to move it you i'm because uh, it it uh, the site was a sight line problem, so if you stood uh, on if you okay. stood on, if you were on the side, you couldn't see the girls coming down the catwalk or something. I don't fucking know. It was just, <laughs> mate. You know, make the decision. Yeah. Like you know, you would have got yeah. planned. Yeah, whatever. But anyway, but uh, you were you 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 were the drummer at hey on hey hey right for many yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, I was for for nine years. For nine years. Yeah. Beautiful. Nine years. Yeah, it was. It was great. It's great fun. I mean, Daryl's a lo- he's a lovely guy. Yeah, well, I I loved it because my he was my boss and yeah. my boss was a drummer. That's right. <laughs> so That's that right. was cool. Did he ever get on the? He was, did he ever get yeah, on the he, kit? He, he, he got on the kit a lot, and yeah. um, you know, sometimes he would hear me playing stuff, and he'd come over to the drum set and want to know what it is, and then he'd sit on the kit and he'd show me stuff, and it was. It was really good. So, did he play as a drummer before he got into entertain, like into visual entertainment? I, 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 I think so. From what I understand, he may have been part of a band that may have played on New Faces back in like maybe nineteen seventy or something like that. Or oh, right. Like he, he was, he was performing. Yeah, right. He was playing, okay. you know, in bands. Okay. And and also singing. So he he was he was kind of destined for. For you know, entertain the entertainment, yeah, the entertainment world, and he's a small guy. He's not very tall either. 
Uh, n- no, but he, he was very fit. I remember many years ago, um, him and I climbed Ayers Rock or, you know, Uluru. I would never do that now, yeah. but we did that back in those days because it was kind of kind of okay to do that, I suppose, back then. And I remember we started, we set out together and he just raced way ahead of me. Like I'm puffed out, you know, pulling, yeah. pulling myself up the chain, trying to get up to the next. And he was just, he, he was running every day. He was really looking after his health. So yeah, he's, he wasn't tall, but he was certainly very fit. That's good. He's onto it. All right. Yeah. So, so uh, we'll wrap it up there. Cool. Uh, it's been great talking to you and um, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me, mate. No worries. Yeah, terrific. <laughs>